When my sister was dying in an ICU in New York City, it was difficult to get straight answers about time. The attending oncologist was uncomfortable and evasive, although he claimed to be an eternal optimist. He said he would know more in three months once the latest round of chemo had a chance to take effect. Finally, one frantic Friday afternoon, my sister asked me to force him to sit down and answer one question. Under what conditions will she be dead in a week? He said, I don't have a crystal ball. If he did have that crystal ball, he would have said, she has three days left. If that crystal ball existed when my sister kissed her daughter goodbye and left for the hospital, it would have said, you will never come home again. You have two weeks left. If that crystal ball existed on the day my sister found she suddenly couldn't walk up a flight of stairs, it would have said, the cancer has spread to your lungs. You have a month and a half left. If that crystal ball existed on the day my sister had both of her breasts removed in an attempt to halt an aggressive stage three cancer, it would have said, the doctors will tell you you will be cured this year, but don't believe them. You have three years left. And if that crystal ball existed on the day my sister entered this world, it would have told her, you have a wonderful life ahead of you. You will be a great athlete. You will be stunningly beautiful and wildly successful in everything you do. But you have a genetic mutation that will make you susceptible to breast cancer. So make the most of your time here. You have 29 years, six months, and 26 days left. So obviously none of us have a crystal ball. Uh, we're not given God's perspective on our lives, and that's probably a good thing because most of us wouldn't leave the house in the morning. But we do have imagination. And so I'd like to invite you to imagine the future with me, your future. On Monday, the conference will be over and we'll all go home and most of you will return to whatever it is you usually do on a Monday, which is probably work because it's our favorite pastime here in America. But just for now, I'd like you to imagine how you might spend your time if you knew for sure you had a little less than 30 years left to live. And for most of us, 30 years is an eternity, so it doesn't change much. We kind of go about our business. What about if you had three years left? So you might notice some things kind of falling away, some things becoming more important. But three years still feels like a pretty long time. How about a month and a half? I'm just going to guess that in about a month and a half, most of us reach our threshold for deciding that work is completely irrelevant and ridiculous. But maybe some of you will keep working all the way through because your work is what really matters to you, and that's okay. There are no right or wrong answers here. It's just trying to kind of get you to think a little bit about how you normally spend your time. What if you had two weeks left? So things start to get pretty serious in around two weeks. The problem is most of us have no clue what makes us happy. So these questions are hard. And I hope if we knew what made us happy, we'd already be doing it. I think that by contemplating the last weeks and days of our life, it could get us a little bit closer to an honest answer about what makes us happy and what really matters. So what if you were in my sister's shoes and the doctor wasn't a complete jerk? and was honest and said, you only have a few days left. You have three days, in fact. How would you want to live? And maybe more importantly, how would you want to die? I've asked other people this question, and as I'm kind of describing it, you can keep thinking about those last three days of your life, which might be completely different than what I'm about to say. But the people I've asked have actually given me pretty simple answers. I want to be with friends and family, I want my pets with me. I want to spend time outside, and if I can't be outside because of some physical limitation, at least I want to see the trees and the sky through a window. I want to listen to beautiful music and look at beautiful art. I want to laugh and be comfortable. I want to float in water. I want to have sex. And I want drugs. Pretty much everybody wants drugs <laughs> with three days left. 
So we never really know when the last day of our life is going to be. And I know that sounds kind of like obvious, but I don't think many of us are living with that reality most of the time. It can be paralyzing. My sister died on a Monday, and it's this thing that since that day, it's hard for me to wake up and not think, if I were dead by midnight, how would I really want to live today? I hope the future includes greater choices around life and death, especially better drugs. But this whole kind of exercise of imagining our dream death is a little privileged, and most of us won't get that chance. So just for the purposes of this talk, I'd like you to actually tell me, by raising your hand, how many of you, if you could, would like to die at home? Okay, so that's a lot of you. How many of you, maybe your home isn't ideal for one reason or another, how many of you would like to die in someone else's home? Maybe on the ocean or in the woods? And if that sounds better, the other, you, if you already said I'd like to die at home, you can now change your answer. <laughs> that sounds better. Okay. And for the winner, how many of you want to die in an institution? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> um, when you actually ask large groups of people, there is like five or ten percent of people who say they want to die in an institution. So they're there for a reason, I guess. Some people like to be there. Um, right now, the efforts to legalize psychedelic medicine depend on those drugs being given in institutions. And I worked in one of those institutions for four years. I was a clinical researcher at Johns Hopkins where we were one of the only research groups in the world giving people high doses of psilocybin. And I could tell you a lot of really boring stories about how to do that kind of research that involves <laughs> bureaucracy and rules and red tape, and it's very tedious. But I'd also have to admit that people had a fantastic time in our institution. And the program has been running for 15 years. It's still going strong. About 70% of people who come through that institution claim to have a profound, life-changing, mystical experience, 70%. And this is in a small room with no windows, some nice art on the wall, a comfy couch, really great music, a single red rose, and a bowl of grapes. Pretty much everybody who goes through that room says that they at least got a, a glimpse of unconditional love. People say their lives improved, they became more open-minded. Some of the effects last for years. And most interesting to me, about a third of people claim to have experienced their own death. So you can imagine how this kind of contemplation about how we spend our time might shift if you experience death, especially if you had terminal illness and were anxious about it. But the thing is, people weren't actually showing up to die for real. <laughs> That was the agreement, you know? It's like we, you agree to come here and participate in the study, and we agree to keep you safe and, and deliver you back to your friends and family. So they were expecting to go home. It was just a little trial run. <laughs> I used to think this would be a great headline. You know, FDA approves psilocybin for people who are dying, because we're all dying, so we all get psilocybin. <laughs> Um, but now I'm not so sure. You know, it's like I've been out of the institution enough that the idea of an FDA stamp of approval is no longer that exciting to me because I worry that the FDA will approve psilocybin but only if you meet strict criteria determined by the scientific studies. Or what if you have to take synthetic psilocybin in a pill, which is how all the studies are done, and you prefer to eat mushrooms that you grew yourself? Uh, what if you have to have the experience with a doctor or a certified psychologist and you'd rather go the route of a tra traditional healer or a spiritual guy? And worst of all, what if you have to check yourself into an institution to have the experience? That doesn't sound like a too super great future to me. I haven't spent much time in hospitals where people are dying, but from what I've seen, these are not happy places. People are alone and in pain. They're being lied to by their doctors about the fact that they're dying. They're surrounded by machines and strangers with very little access to spiritual guidance. 
My sister had one of the best experiences a person could manage in a place like that, and it was still horrible to watch. It's like dying in an ICU in America is a particularly luxurious version of hell. And it's happening all the time. So the hospices I visited are better, for sure. Um, they're aesthetically pleasant, and if you're a visitor, they're kind of nice places to visit for a short time. And the staff are really kind and compassionate, and they have things like aromatherapy and massage. But I also find those places to be pretty empty and lonely. And I for sure wouldn't want to die there if I had the choice. On one of my visits, I actually asked the head nurse where all the people were. <laughs> and as it turns out, if you build a really nice facility and it's for people who are dying, healthy people don't really want to spend time there. And so people don't get visits from their friends and family. They still end up being alone. And the smart people who can manage it, they decide to stay at home as long as they can because that's where they have all their familiar things and they know that people will visit them at home. So the more I've talked to people who work in hospice, they've explained to me that it's not really about the facility. It's, I mean, the facility exists for people who really can't manage to be at home, but most of the work happens in people's homes. And it's about helping people live as fully as possible until their very last breath. It's about involving the family, and it's about honoring the dead. A young oncology nurse recently told me, her name was Jennifer Brown from New York City, and she said, the first death I experienced in a hospital, the family was ushered out of the room pretty quick, quickly, and I was told to put the body in a plastic bag with a biohazard sticker on the outside. <laughs> and in hospice, the family's encouraged to stay as long as they want. We place flowers around the body, and when everyone's ready, we wrap the individual in a white sheet. When she told me this story, I knew that the first case is what happened with my sister's body. And I didn't know if there was anything else I could have done at that moment, but I knew it was wrong to leave her there after she died. So about six months ago, I was giving another talk in New York City, and someone in the audience said, what if someone gave you all the money you needed for a big project, what would you do? And I said I would create a psychedelic hospice. But I don't know what that looks like, and I don't really know how to create one. And I'm pretty sure it's not as simple as just adding psilocybin to existing facilities, kind of for all the reasons I've just gone through. And I could also see us spending a ton of money building the most beautiful building and coming up with perfect death rituals and filling the building with all the things that we think people might want. And nobody shows up, because it's not where they want to be. And so I think a lot of the time, within the psychedelic movement, we kind of all believe that we're all kind of expressing the views of the general population. And um, we should be really careful about prescribing our version of reality onto others. So I think a good way to start creating a real life psychedelic hospice, not just one in our minds, is to ask people what they want when they're dying. What would make them feel safe and loved and comfortable and inspired? whether or not that would include drugs and at what point in the dying process. I think it involves asking friends and family members what was missing when your loved one was dying. How, how could we have made it better for you and them? Maybe we could ask people, do you think it would be possible to create a place that's so awesome and inspiring and welcoming that even healthy people want to spend time there? Whether it's your own person, loved one who's dying or maybe it's just such a great place that you want to be of service and spend time there as a volunteer. What about a place where healthy people get to take psychedelics along with sick people? I mean, these things seem kind of simple to me, but they're so far from the future that I see a lot of this work heading that I wonder if it's even possible. And then there's the other kind of simple fact that if we can't figure out how to make a place where people want to be, then we just have to figure out how to give people psychedelics in, at their homes, which is where they want to be already. And again, it seems really simple, but none of the work being done now is really in that direction.
So I've said before that high dose psychedelics are good death practice. And I think that's true for some people. But for me personally, I keep going back to what I learned with my sister. And basically what she taught me was that you definitely don't need psychedelics to die. You don't need to ever have even taken a psychedelic. That death is this natural, mysterious process that we all know how to do, but we don't believe it until it actually happens to us. And death itself is kind of psychedelic, and it's a sacrament that can be shared. But, I mean, I saw my sister die right in front of my eyes, and it still is this really strange thing where I'm, I'm scared to die. I don't know what that would be like. It's, it doesn't matter how close you get to it. Until it happens to you, it's like you kind of don't believe it's going to. Um, and the hardest part, I think we can agree, is the waiting and not knowing. I mean, it's one thing if you have terminal illness and you don't know when you're going to die, but none of us really do. And so I think a lot of the anxiety we experience as a culture and the stress and the addiction and the workaholism and all of that, it's because we're just afraid to die. We don't know how to spend our time. <laughs> um, it's almost like we're scared of all of the things that go along with life, which includes pain and suffering and being alone and not knowing if we're ever gonna see certain people ever again. And so in a way, by contemplating death, we actually get closer to life. And the two aren't that different. And so for me, my sister's death dramatically shifted my sense of time. It changed how I lived my life almost completely. Um, I quit my dream job at Hopkins. Um, no one was really happy about that except I knew it was the right thing to do at the time. I had so many questions, so I went all over the world looking for answers. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, at some point, the grief became so great that I definitely would have preferred to die. And so I found a great therapist, and I did a lot of healing work. And then I settled into a pretty simple life where I get to take naps, and be barefoot and swim outside. So now I live on a farm with my husband and I get to play with goats and sing to cows. Even if that means we're, I'm singing them to their deaths, it's still a great relationship. <laughs> um, and I get to ask trees for advice instead of mentors. The trees have a lot more to say. <laughs> Um, and I'm embarking on this completely crazy journey of growing a human, which I have no idea how to do. It's just happening, and there are moments when I'm terrified, and I don't know how to do it right, and um, it's by far the most psychedelic thing I've ever done. So I'm completely amazed by all the women out there who aren't into psychedelics but have given birth. It's like... <laughs> um, um, so kind of bringing it back to the psychedelic work, there is a huge part of me that misses sitting with people in sessions. And I miss when that used to be my full-time job. Because it, really, it brought me a lot of joy, and it was amazing to see people's lives change every day. And sharing that experience just barely made up for all of the other horrible parts of working in a research lab in a really strict institution. But I also wonder if psychedelics are really the answer, because I had all sorts of experiences up until my sister died, and it was her death that was the thing that really shook me enough to wake me up. And so I don't know what to prescribe to somebody else. I certainly wouldn't want to prescribe what I went through, but it worked. Whatever work is, it worked for me. Um, it's especially hard to say, just take a bunch of mushrooms and you'll figure it out, because we know that there are plenty of people taking plenty of psychedelics, and I mean, <laughs> they're not really that happy or enlightened or kind a lot of the time. And so I think as a community, we need to figure out what's missing. Why do psychedelics work, but they also don't work? And why do they break down boundaries around ego and trauma and help people become more open, and they also create really powerful egos within the psychedelic community and all this territorial infighting. Like, how does that work? And these aren't kind of peripheral issues. You know, it's not like 
things are going to just fix themselves if we keep going forward. I mean, it could get a lot worse before it gets better. And maybe conferences like this are an opportunity to kind of take a step back and say, like, is this moving in the right direction? So I guess at the end of the day, you know, kind of balancing everything out, of course I feel like more people should take more psychedelics. <laughs> I mean, I think that could improve the situation. There are plenty of people I know who are fairly middle of the road, very normal, and when I ask them, would you take psychedelics tomorrow, they say no, and I say, would you take psychedelics if you were dying, and they say, absolutely. So that's kind of interesting to me. <laughs> Maybe it's just about shifting a perspective. But this is kind of the little preachy part about meditation. For me, out of all the experiences I've had that are kind of wild and crazy and profound, I think I've learned the most when I just learned to sit still and be quiet and be with myself, all the different parts of myself, even the parts I don't like. And I think that that extends to being able to be with others, especially when they're in pain. And so if anything, if all of our experiences help us serve others, then we've done something really good. Um, there's another woman that I had the privilege of sitting with as she was slowly surrendering to metastatic breast cancer. And we were talking about her options and things she wanted to do before she died. And I basically told her what my sister went through and I said, you know, there were so many things she just couldn't do because she ran out of time. And this woman looked at me and said, what your sister went through at 29, it was the same, it's the same for me at 75. I'm not ready and I don't know how to let go. But I either have no time at all or all the time in the world. Thank you.